Okay, well, um, I'm a professional tree hugger. And uh, so I've been a conservation scientist for 30 years. And uh, you know, I've been listening to these talks and I've met many of you and talked to you one-on-one. -on -one, and I can say with certainty, I represent the least influential, the most marginalized voice in America right now. And you might think that's an overstatement. But um, when one of our presidential candidates uh, accepted the nomination and made this remark, and I, this is not gonna be a political talk, but, but reflect on this remark. This remark basically dismisses, in a way, the notion of caring about the planet. It, dis it dismisses that notion. And I don't blame that on Romney, and I don't blame that on the Republicans. I blame that on my tribe of fellow tree huggers and conservation scientists. And let me explain why um, we need to reframe the topic. Well, this whole three days is about resilience. It's about the things we can do with technology and society and ourselves to be resilient. But the conservation movement has fallen into a narrative just the opposite, of fragility. You know, these are just one of many images you get off the web associated with how we think about the planet Earth. If you go to the website of just about any environmental group, Audubon, my organization, the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife, Conservation International, et cetera, and you, you know, look, and see what they write about coral reefs, see what they write about deserts, see what they write about tropical forests, almost inevitably they'll emphasize fragile. It's as though Mother Earth is this delicate child and you just have to tiptoe tip through it. There isn't that science behind that. I think the reason for that stance is it makes all subsequent negotiations simple. Because then, if you really do have to just tiptoe through, through nature, tiptoe through nature, if you really, if any sort of intrusion or activity is at risk of breaking nature, then you just draw the line in the sand and say, no, people out, activity out, economic activity out. And a second dimension of this narrative of fragility as opposed to resilience is a doom and gloom. Now you can go back to Reverend Malthus, and I know probably everybody out there knows about Malthus's predictions about overpopulation and famine, and there have been many other grandiose ones since then. Malthus is a most unpleasant gentleman. But, um, <laughs> but even at a, at a less dramatic way, uh, just comment on three that I've been intimately involved with with the data myself. The first image there is, is about empty skies without birds. Well, early on as an, editor, a as an editor for a really prestigious journal, I got in the midst of this controversy. And it was that many magazines had under cover that because of habitat loss, we were anticipated in North America, empty skies, skies with no birds. As it turned out, half the species were increasing, half were decreasing. Just as you'd expect by chance alone, but we turned it into a doom and gloom narrative. The empty ocean, a little bit more, uh, more recent. So, so I suspect many of you have this sense that, that we're so ravaging the ocean that it really is at risk of being empty. That has appeared prominently on our major media. Well, that was based on a paper published in Science, and in that same journal, Science, maybe six months later, a year later, there was a second paper published using the same data that said it was flawed, deeply flawed. And that last image there of the little girl uh, looking at the salmon on the wall, I was a salmon biologist. I headed up salmon conservation at NOAA. That's a full page ad in the New York Times that many conservation groups signed on to, and it said with certainty salmon will be gone by 2017. Wait and see, they won't. And so this narrative, this notion is, um, it's, 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 it's almost more negative and it's more of a downer that I was a, was a, went to Catholic school than my nuns used to hit me with. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's actually, this is not a, I mean, it's not, this is a serious matter. My organization and the conservation movement in general is populated by older people. I'm not even gonna tell you, we have over a million members, I'm not gonna, I'd be embarrassed to tell you their average or median age. I will say that they make me young, okay? And so we've gone out and, and started talking to kids, 15, 17, 18 year olds in schools in Oakland, in San Antonio, in Denver, focus groups, polling. And what do they say about conservation? We ask them, what do they think? They say, when we say, what do you think of a conservationist? Well, she's white, she's probably blonde, nice person, but preachy, boring, would never invite her to a party. And um, I think most of you would get invited to a party. 
And it, but you know, it gets serious. It gets more serious than that. What this means is that conservation get painted into a conflict situation where totally unnecessarily, there is no need for this, totally unnecessarily, we get in a situation where it's farmers versus conservation, where it's loggers versus conservation, where it's fishermen versus conservation. It need not be that way. I felt it very personally when I was younger and I was a professor, I testified in a federal court in Seattle about spotted owls. And I thought I was an eco-hero. I had my Birkenstocks and I could sit in a lotus position, you know, I can't do that anymore. But in the back of the, of the courtroom was a logger with a child, you know, where you have your kids like this, shaking the, the kid, the kid would cry, same age as my kids, there'd be a sign saying, you care more about owls than feeding my child. That's serious. So let me um, sort of recast that narrative. Let's talk about fragility. This uh, uh, image right here is the, when the last hydrogen bomb test, it vaporized the Bikini Atoll. Vaporized the Bikini Atoll, it boiled the ocean, literally boiled the ocean there. And uh, there was a recent expedition back there, this is what the coral looks like. 25% coral than there was before the bomb. Took a while, I'm not, thinking I'd eat the fish there, but still, <laughs> that's, a, that's still remarkable ecological resilience. Closer to home, my father was, started out as a coal miner, grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and for a family vacation, uh, we went to Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, and I, I, as I remember it, I, this is in the 50s, it looked a little bit not quite as bad as the lower photograph there. But I remember going to the rivers and they were toxic, they were polluted. There were not houses along them. They were corrosive, there were no fish there, nobody fished there. I had, by, by sheer accident, the Ecological Society had a meeting in Pittsburgh three summers ago. I went back for the first time and went running along the reclaimed trail. I don't know if any of you have been to Pittsburgh along that trail. It's beautiful, it is spectacular, and they have bass fishing tournaments there. Just so you don't feel sorry for me in terms of my family vacations, they also took me to Yellowstone when I was a little bit older. And when I went to Yellowstone, there was no chance of seeing this. Yellowstone was still beautiful. It was still spectacular, but there was no way I would have seen wolves and a buffalo herd and now you can see grizzly bears. Not only would I not have seen it, if I'd mentioned conversationally that you might see it, people would have said I'm crazy. No way. There's going to be wolves and grizzly bears and you can go there and count on hearing the wolves at night. Pretty neat. That really is breathtakingly neat. Oh, I love this creature. You may recognize him. Uh, the coyote. It's a neat story. I don't know how many of you know this. But in the, in the 1800s, wolves got at such a low number uh, that, um, that uh, Mr. Wolf had a hard time finding Lady Wolf. And um, like some people, they take love where you can find it. He found a, a Lady Coyote. And the result is in eastern coyotes now, eastern coyotes have wolf genes in them. And that's very cool. The eastern coyotes are about 10 pounds heavier. They're bigger. They have strong jaws. The, the, the western coyote, the natural coyote diet is rabbits and rodents. These, these wolf coyotes can take down deer. And I think that, that's pretty cool. That's how innovative, how neat evolution could do this. This is my soulmate right here. Um, this is the cane toad. The cane toad, um, some of you know this story, was brought in 100 of them to Australia. It took off, it's a plague. There's 200 million of them in, in, in Australia and they're considered a real pest. And they're a pest because if snakes try to eat them, they die because they got toxins. Well, just within a few years, we've discovered that snakes have figured out, I won't go into the details, but morphologically they've evolved and they sort of outsmarted this and now they can eat them. Pretty neat, this evolution thing, isn't it? I do not mean to say with these stories about Pittsburgh rivers and Yellowstone and cane toads and wolves that we don't damage the environment. We for sure damage the environment. There's no question about that. And this iconic image you know, of Deepwater Horizon is evidence of that. But even when we damage the environment, it's, if there's any good news, we seem to resist it. The photo there is Jane Luchenko, who's a, a heroine for conservation. She spent her entire career doing marine conservation. She presented in a press conference a pie chart that showed that there was much less oil than we thought because microbes were eating it. They were eating it, we should have known that. They were eating it because the water was warmer, well, not like Exxon Valdez in Alaska, and there's a natural seepage of a pretty heavy flow of oil, so there's a rich fauna of, 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 of bacteria ready and evolved to eat it. 
but she was chastised because people just didn't want to believe it. You didn't read it. You didn't, this was not emphasized, but it was a big deal. That oil spill did much less damage than anybody expected because of this microbial response. Nobody talks about it. This is one of my favorites, this sort of dichotomy between, I hate all natural. What's all natural? It's like vitalism or something. There's some, you know, it's like all natural versus technology. And a lot of the conservation tribe has gotten into that dichotomy. Like you're either perfectly natural, untouched, pure, or my God, technology. It's, and you know, kids unplugged on Earth Day, getting them off their cell phones, you know, that, that might be a light matter, but it's not all light matter. Over 30 countries ban GMOs. Over 30 countries ban GMOs. Ecuador, you know, has a constitution, constitution, no GMOs. Now, GMOs have risk, but the National Academy has made it clear that it's a pretty solid technology, and this banning is serious consequences. This is a cassava. A nonprofit, not a company to make profit, a nonprofit has engineered cassava so that it's virus resistant and it's enriched with protein. And that's the main problem with cassava. It, cassava doesn't need much water, doesn't need fertilizer. That cassava could be a boon to conservation because it wouldn't have heavy fertilizer doshas, wouldn't use a lot of water, and it would feed people. But the anti GMO thing is going to make a problem for getting that in Africa. You know, technology is what you make of it. Um, the thing, the, the image up there of that flying, I think some of you may have heard the talk from Isuzu, Isuzu earlier, you know, that's the Scan Eagle, which has military purposes right now. But remember, that technology came from tuna boats tracking tuna, and there's no reason that technology couldn't be the greatest environmental sensor there is. And this notion of unplugging kids, I don't want to unplug kids, I want kids to use these cell phones and go out and do citizen science with them. They could do amazing science and environmental stuff with them. So my reframing is to think about nature as natural capital. And it's not just mine, it's the nature conservancies in many conservation groups. It helps business and it helps people. And this is a, we'll see what happens with this. You know, we don't, nature has people in it joyous. This is a, a, a postcard we sent in Alabama. In these depressed times, we're trying to get the public to vote for spend public money on protecting wildlands in, in, in Alabama. We'll wait and see in a few weeks what happens with that vote. I'm really, really hopeful, but pay attention. Just think what that means. In one of the poorest states in the country and one of the hardest times if we can get people to, to embrace nature. But it's because we talk about it this way. We don't talk about it this way, all right? <laughs> um, it's, and it's, a, it's amazing. Another dimension many of you may not realize um, from the Deepwater Horizon is that, is that one of the things it did, and you may have been touched by this, is it drew attention to the fact what of a magnificent ecosystem and a special national treasure the Gulf is. It's a treasure for its seafood. It's a treasure for its culture. It's a, it's, it's, it's a treasure for the recreation we get there and its natural beauty. And it really inspired a lot of us. Well, it inspired the Nature Conservancy as well. And we've gotten volunteers and hired people and raised money. And we're trying to put back all the oyster reefs from the Gulf. It costs a million dollars a mile. That's not bad. So maybe a uh, thousand miles, a billion dollars. Still not bad. But that's a vision of working with people to put back oyster reefs. And I have to say, you know, ideas are good. But one of the neat things about my job is you get to do stuff and see stuff. And one of my scientists, I was just meeting with my scientist earlier this week, and she, Judy Hayner is her name, I have to give her credit. Judy Hayner in Alabama led this project. Um, and what you see there is, is, is the change as a result of putting in oyster reefs. So the farthest um, right-hand side, you can actually see the oysters very clearly. You can see the oyster reefs that we've built very clearly. And you can see what I've circled there is a marsh land being reclaimed. Get on Google, and you can see the result of that action. Well, those oyster reefs are also going to deliver oysters for food, fish habitat, sand for the beaches, protect against storm surge and flooding and, and damage to people, and that's just the beginning of what the oyster reefs do. Amazing. That's a benefit to people. And um, this is not because the Supreme Court said corporations are people, but nature also figures into the economy of corporations. We all know corporations, they're like keystone species. 
the, because of the energy and material flow, they have huge impacts on the world and the planet. But the planet also can benefit them. This is Dow Chemicals plant in Freeport. 10,000 employees, it's a mini city. And we work with Dow to do something very much like that oyster reef, only it's salt marshes, because what the salt marshes do is protect Dow's facilities from storm surge and hurricanes. And we can quantify it, we have solid science to show that. And it borders a, a wildlife refuge. That's pretty neat. It's in the corporation's best interest to make an alliance with protecting nature there. And so I don't know what the future is going to hold it all in, in conservation. Um, I'm a sci-fi buff, so I put together this sort of slide here. And um, you know, the, the lower left-hand corner, it might look like it's a sci-fi slide. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody have a guess? Anybody been to Seoul? That's a river that runs through the center of Seoul, Korea, and it used to be covered with, it, 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 it was covered totally with concrete. Covered totally with concrete. They removed the concrete, restored the river, and it's a vibrant center of nature that runs right through the center of Seoul. People love it, it's like Central Park. It's, I mean, it's pretty wonderful. This has happened in rivers all around. The upper right hand um, figure, that is sci-fi. Who knows, that may be the future cities of the world. The woolly mammoth, I threw that in there. Many of you may know this. But the woolly mammoth I threw in there because um, there's a Japanese lab. And uh, they've assured us, and I'm pretty confident they could. I'm not sure they should. But they could, within four or five years, bring back the woolly mammoth uh, gestated through an African elephant. So you get, take the woolly mammoth DNA, put it in an egg, um, and then the, the African elephant is the, is the mother. Um, now. That might scare a lot of you, and, and it probably should. But I put it there to just recognize that this, this, this amazing combination of technology and nature has just astonishing possibilities. So I think the default, instead of the default being fragile nature, the default is in fact resilient nature. It's resilient. You want to learn how to be resilient, look at evolution and what it produces. And add in technical innovation, and there's no reason we need the doom and gloom. Absolutely no reason. It doesn't mean it's automatically going to happen. It's going to require smart and thoughtful choices. But nonetheless, this fragile doom and gloom narrative is going nowhere. But let me re return at the end to this quote. Okay? So this is, again, Candidate Romney's acceptance speech quote. And after he dismissed Obama's caring about healing the planet, he said, my promise is to help you and your family. I'm sure he believes that. I'm sure he really does want to help you and your family. But there's a dissonance there, isn't there? I mean, you and your family live on this planet, right? But it's my fault. It's, 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 the conservation's com community, my tribe of fellow professional tree huggers fault for having allowed this dissonance to exist, for having allowed us to get in battles of jobs versus conservation, for having overstated fragility, for always being about doom and gloom and for not embracing technology. And I think I'll end it there, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Perfect.